Um, so my name is Elizabeth Dick and I work with the Organic Growers Research and Information Sharing Network. That's funny because that's a new organization. I'm currently the only employee, but this name is Ogren. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about several things and I'm going to have to be very brief because I was asked to, to talk about varieties, testing grain quality, innovative on-farm processing, and then I want to talk about a new project that could help you out uh, if you're interested in, in growing food grains. So you have in your hands a yellow sheet uh, front and back. I'll just let you know right now that's a survey that we're starting this new project off. I'm, I'm waiting till the very end of my 15 minutes. I've got 15 minutes to do this in to talk about that. But if you're interested in getting more information or working with us, then you might want to start filling it out. And if you can give it to me by the end of the session, that's great. If not, you can mail it to me. Um, so. Let me start out with varieties. Because I have so little time, what I'm relying on are some fact sheets that I've developed with other people. They're on the Ogren website, but they're being passed around right now. So I'm just going to touch on really, really critical issues. It's not easy to get varieties of food grade grains, especially small grains. It's very difficult, in fact. The United States has not been keeping up with this. Um, a lot of the hard red wheats, for example, has to come out of Canada. Um, a lot of the heritage varieties have actually crossed the Atlantic and are now only coming back. Um, so the bottom line, however, with varieties is that varieties really do, variety really does matter. You have to, you have to do some research. You have to um, talk to other people, um, talk to other farmers, talk to people like me, talk to um, uh, the wheat breeders that I'm going to be talking about in a minute. Because variety matters, it's very critical, for example, in wheat that you get a, a wheat that's going to perform well in the Northeast region, and that's not easy because of our climate. So um, take a look at that, that fact sheet is on spring grains. Um, I know a few people that are still planting wheat, but it's a little late for this year, and we'll soon have more information out on winter varieties, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. What I would suggest is that you do not buy variety not specified. If you're going to sell food grade grains, you've got to start out with something that you know exactly what it is. And you are, you're convinced you have good information that it's a pure, pure variety. The other thing is that it's great to buy from a fellow grower. Sometimes you, that's your best source of supply. But make very sure that the seed has good germination, that it's been adequately cleaned, and that it is not contaminated with fusarium. Fusarium is the pathogen that causes wheat scab or head blight. Um, and it's one of our major problems in this part of the world because it can occur and probably will occur when the grain at flo when the wheat, barley, and rye at flowering is hit with a lot of rain. Fusarium is ubiquitous in the environment. It can infect the heads and it will drastically reduce the quality of the grain. In fact, Mary Howell was, talk uh, Mary Howell was talking about five parts per million um, vomitoxin. That's the toxin that can be produced by the fusarium pathogen in the grain. Um, for food grain, it's one part per million. If you have more than one part per million, you're in serious trouble, although you, there are possibilities of, of using cleaning techniques to get rid of some of it. Um, so good seed can be hard to find. Consider joining. We have a buying club that doesn't cost anything to join. So if you're interested in getting your hands on um, commercial lots or even backyard lots of some of these varieties, heritage varieties, et cetera, um, let me know. And what I, what I, I first put this in picture in here. I don't have a lot of time for pictures today. but. Um, this is excellent seed. This happens to be an emmer variety. Emmer is an ancient grain. It's a hulled wheat. It's delicious. I just had 30 people over for my mother's 90th birthday party and I put out about four cups of cooked emmer and man, I was beating them off with a stick. They wanted that emmer and um, so there are a couple people, in, there's one man in here anyway that can supply you with emmer. But anyway, this is very, very high quality seed. You can see that blonde seed. It's not darkened. It's not darkened by the weather. And it's, um, it's, uh, I saw the test results for this particular batch, and it's, it's very low on weed seed content. So you have to, you have to go after um, high quality seed for planting. Do not get into the habit of when your crop goes wrong. For example, if you have bring in a crop with six parts per million vomitoxin, you can't sell it. The tendency is going to be to try to plant it. That may not be the, the wisest thing to do for the long term. It's easy for me to say, however. Grain quality testing. Now here I have to differ a little bit with Ed Malpe. Um, I, if you're going to market wheat as high value, as a high value crop, and what Glenda said is absolutely true. I have people calling me all the time that want food grade wheat, rye, barley, corn, you name it. Very rarely 
can I can I supply them? Because there's just not enough out there. So it's a real potential market, but it requires high quality grain, and that means testing it. You don't have to test it for everything. I have another handout for the things that I that most people seem to be concerned about. Briefly, that's protein content, falling number. Falling number measures the sproutedness of the seed. It has it has uh, effects on baking quality, and then finally for um, testing for vomitoxin, whether or not how high if and it's perfectly possible in the Northeast to grow zero vomitoxin grain. I've seen many, many lots of it. So don't don't assume that your your wheat is going to have uh, fusarium, but don't assume that it isn't either. It's very important to test. And um, to, to get the best price you can for your crop, test it yourself. There are mills that will test it for you, but you won't get back the results, at least only verbally. Um, so what if you don't want to take their price, or what if they tell you that it's not good enough? then where are you? So I go into it in more detail in, in the uh, handout sheet, but um, I definitely, am a, whenever anyone calls me and wants some help with marketing, and I do connect people with people that have called me, obviously, that want product and people that are able to supply it, if I don't ask, I mean, I'll ask you for your quality test results. And more and more, the end users, be they consumers um, who just want wheat to grind for themselves, or mills, or bakeries, they're going to ask you for those results too. Um, it costs what about forty-nine dollars to do all three tests at uh, a reputable testing laboratory. That's for one. You do that for one field, for example. So it's not seven hundred dollars. It's forty-nine bucks. Is not, you know, it's not small change, but nevertheless, it, it pays off. So what I also wanted to tell you a little bit about is um, I was lucky enough to go onto some French farms, um, French organic wheat farms in the south of France last year. I was there in November, so I didn't see many. I just saw a little bit of winter wheat and einkorn. Einkorn is another ancient grain that's in very high, can be in very high demand. Um, we don't have a commercial supply of it. We're working on that. I'll get into that in a minute. But anyway, what was interesting about these farms is their innovation in terms of food grade grain production. And these were small farms. They were around 25 acres. Um, and the farmers would pull me aside and say, look, we are making it. We're making it economically. And they were pounding into me that two, their two, these are all organic farmers, of course, their two keys to success in food grade grain production and marketing was diversity of crops grown. They were really growing, uh, trying to uh, not grow. They weren't just growing wheat, although wheat was their major crop. They were growing einkorn. They were growing emmer, the ancient wheats. Uh, they were growing some spelt. They were growing um, uh, a variety of pulse crops. And they were pushing the envelope as much as they could to get more diversity in their rotations. And um, there are always problems. They, they, too, were coming up against a rotation which was going to give them enough wheat to make You'll see what they're going to do with it in a second. But the other key to their success was on-farm processing. And here they were really way ahead of most, most things I've seen in this, on this co continent. It was very exciting. Now, you know, cultures are different, but nevertheless, I think they have some, some things to say to us. So just to give you some ideas, here's an on-farm bakery. Um, in, and these are several farms mixed together uh, where I got the pictures. But for example, I've talked about these ancient grains, emmer, Belt and einkorn. They need another step in the processing process. After when you harvest them, they'll stay in the hull. They do not. They're not free threshing wheat, and so you have to dehull them. And the in this country that has turned into a real stumbling block uh, because uh, the cheapest good de dehuller that I know in this country costs eighteen thousand dollars. And they can go up to forty thousand and sixty thousand dollars easily because usually, they, well, it depends on whether you're importing them or not. But these French farmers, this is an Italian dehuller that's 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 considered. I don't know how much it costs this particular farmer, but these farmers have found they there is a developing small farm equipment industry in Europe that these folks are taking advantage of, and I think we can if we can emulate them, um, we can go places. So this is a this is an on-farm dehuller. This is an on-farm mill uh, manufactured in France for small-scale milling. And what it does is it's going constantly. It's going 24 hours a day, grinding very slowly. Um, and the farmer didn't tell me the price, but he said that it was quite cheap. And when I asked him for the manufacturer, he said, uh-uh, there, there's such long waiting lists. We have to serve French farmers first. So um, 
the farms also usually had a pasta maker, so they were also making pasta. And um, they, many, many, many of them also had an on-farm bakery. So they were process, and this is where they, this, this is what they said about the key, they don't have cash flow problems. Because 50 or 52 weeks a year, they've got product to sell. They're selling their pasta, of course, they're selling their bread every week for uh, locally um, and regionally. So that was quite exciting. So here is one farm. You can see the loaves of bread. You can the middle trays are, are pasta made from emmer. And this, this farm was very interesting because it was using einkorn and wheat to make um, uh, bread, uh, raised bread. And um, the advantage of the einkorn, of course, is that it's, it's this really ancient grain that can have a very high lutein content. First of all, it has a very distinctive flavor, as does emmer. So it tastes really interesting and delicious. But also, some, some einkorn variety land races have very high lutein, L-U-T-E-I-N, which is um, a beta, uh, which is a carotenoid that is linked to, if you, if you put more of it into your diet, it reduces uh, degenerative diseases. So it, as a health food, einkorn could be really, really big. Um, and so here we see one of the, one of the farmers. This happens to be Jean-Francois Bertelot. Um, and his amazing product line. This farmer was very interesting. Um, her name is going out of my mind. And, but the young woman with the cap was the woman that was showing me around the farms. Her name is Julie Dawson. I'll talk about her in a minute. She was, an, she was a postdoc with INRA, the French Agricultural um, Service. And uh, she's a breeder. And she was, inter she was working with these farmers on on-farm breeding. And this, this, oh, this is Florence. And the reason I wanted you to meet Florence, at least the picture of her, is she's, she's a grain farmer. But when she saw how well some of her colleagues were doing baking, for two or three years she did nothing but try, try out recipes and try them on her family. And now she has a thriving bakery on her farm and is, is going, going to town. So you don't necessarily have to be trained as a baker or a pasta maker to, to, to think about these things. Of course, you have to gain experience and you have to love this. Somebody with Tor was telling me, you know, this is this is hard work. It sounds romantic and wonder, wonderful, and that on-farm bakery looks fantastic with all the all the uh, perennial flowers around it. But it is it is isn't concentrated work. So these farmers were growing their own crops, processing their own crops, creating value-added products, and selling them directly to the consumer. And they were convinced that this process, combined with their devotion to diversity, was what was was making for a good living for themselves. They're not rich but they're sustainable. So very quickly, um, I just wanted to introduce you to a new project. It's called the Value Added Grain Project for Local and Regional Food Systems. Um, and the title says it all. We're trying to add value to grain to benefit farmers, processors, consumers by doing a number of different things. First, we're tackling the variety land race issue. We don't have necessarily good uh, varieties available for the Northeast. So we're going to be looking at, we're going to be trialing on station, on, on university stations, on, on little research stations like I have, but also on farms. So if you're interested in doing this work, if you're interested, here's an opportunity to trial some of these varieties. There'll be some, we got 44 varieties from those French farmers. So we're, we're bulking those. We have uh, uh, American heritage varieties. You've all probably all heard of Red Fife, the 1842 one from Ontario, Canada. It's very famous. Robert, for example, grew a commercial crop of Red Fife. Um, but there are many other varieties. And we're bulking those, and we're trying to see um, which ones will do well on, on farms in this area. Uh, we're also going to be looking at planting rate and fertility management recommendations because these varieties haven't been grown for many, many years, most of them. Um, and we're going to see how they, what the best, uh, the best management practices on organic farms. Other things that we're doing, um, we're identifying techniques from planting through storage to optimize grain quality. And Tor is going to be giving you, and Ed will be giving you some examples about their strategic use of particular management techniques. It, it doesn't stop at harvest, although planting through harvest is very important. And I have a fact sheet that I wrote with Tor on five essential steps to wheat production, which I recommend that you read because you have to, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a holistic process and it doesn't stop when you harvest. You've got to be right on top of things in terms of cleaning, in terms of storage, sometimes in terms of drying. 
but it can be done, and it can be done at a variety of different scales. I'm working with someone that grows two acres of wheat, and he's marketing like crazy, marketing it a, a pound for a red West Fife wheat, two dollars and sixty cents a pound. So, and of course, it works at you'll you'll see an intermediate scale of production with, the, and it, Ed and Tor will be talking about that, and it also can work at a larger scale. The other thing that we'll be doing is evaluating harvesting, bee hauling, and milling options for large and small scale farmers. So Robert Perry, for example, is going to be in charge of, a, we're going to put together a mobile harvesting and processing unit that's going to go to communities where farmers that are doing small scale production can evaluate the equipment because, as you know, one of the big problems, um, uh, Glenda was talking about lack of infrastructure. We haven't done this for years and years and years. So all the infrastructure that was there has mostly gone away, and one big problem is getting the right equipment to do the job, particularly for small scale. It's not easy for the other scale farmers either. Um, and then we're going to be invest investigating multiple strategies for accessing local and regional markets. And um, the market right now, the demand is, is outpacing supply, remembering, and Tor will speak to this, I'm sure, that there can be bumps in the road. For example, if you grow a great crop of emmer, but you can't get it dehulled, what are you going to do? If you grow a, an, a, a nice crop, of you, if you get a fairly decent yield of a nice hard red, red, red winter wheat, but your protein content is below what the bakers will accept, what do you do? So we're in the learning process. It's not like you can, it's a, it's a cash cow you can immediately milk. But I think there is real potential here. Um, so just one more thing, and then I think I've actually made it in 15 minutes. This is a four-year project. We're just starting up. We've got a really fine bunch of people that we're working with from a number of institutions. Cornell is the lead. My own institution, NOFA, PASA, Penn State, Green Market of New York City. So we have a fantastic, uh, already a marketing partner there. Um, North Dakota State University and Northern Plains Sustainable Ag Society. That's based in North Dakota. They are a wonderful partner. You know, that emmer that was cupped in that person's hands, that was being grown in North Dakota. It turns out that emmer, this really rare ancient grain, has been grown in this country for over 100 years by German immigrants that brought it from the Volga River Basin and established farms in North Dakota and southern Manitoba in that area, Montana. And for years, they've been growing land races, different land races of emmer, this precious crop, and feeding it to their animals because it's a great seed. And now they too would like to um, de-haul and start marketing it as a food grade. And so they're very anxious to work with us, but they have a lot of expertise in how to grow emmer, and that's where we got our seed stock from. Uh, so um, the Organic Center, we have an economist from the Organic Center that's working with us, and then also Oregon State University. We have an information specialist there who's going to help get all this information disseminated in a number of different ways. And then we have a terrific 13-member advisory committee. TOR is on it. It's, uh, it consists of farmers, processors, millers, bakers, chefs um, that are going to give us lots of advice on where we uh, shouldn't go wrong and what we should be concentrating on. So this is a project that is related to that yellow sheet of paper. And if you can fill that out, or even part of it, the most important thing is to give me your name and contact information, then we can, in we can include you. There's also question six asks, how would you like to be included? Maybe. This isn't, you're not signing your, your participation away in blood, but if you're interested in working with us, for heaven's sake, let us know because we are certainly interested in working with you. So I think I will let Tor hit. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, so this is the PowerPoint that we chopped down. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the progression of this is going to be. Anyway, my name is Tor Ochsner. Um, I farm uh, 650 acres in Tompkins County. And uh, these are some of the crops that we grow. We also, as, as uh, Glenda said, we have a small flour mill we're processing. Uh, grain, um, we grind uh, probably, I think we are doing about six tons uh, a month of just wheat flour and then we grind corn for polenta, or a lot of rye flour. We have one bakery down in New York City, a um, guy who makes this uh, Finnish rye bread, he buys a ton a week of rye flour from us. So. Um, 
I guess we're we're a, a little bit bigger than Ed, but still a small small mill uh, by mill standards. I mean, mills. It's am amazing to see a real a real serious flour mill. Uh, we ground everything with stones. Um, you had a burn mill, which is I think two metal discs that go together. Uh, we use stones, um, which supposedly is when we started looking into this is you get the highest quality flour uh, lower temperatures um, so that's kind of how we got into it but it's not a particularly speedy way to grind um, so anyway we're growing corn I grow both feed and food grade corn uh, difference being uh, the different varieties as Elizabeth was talking about we grow a flint corn uh, hybrid which has a very hard end of sperm which when you grind it breaks up into little chunks because polenta is most of our corn market. Uh, right now we're combining animal feed corn. Uh, the wheat that soft white winter wheat, uh, which is a low protein like pastry wheat, hard red uh, uh, winter wheat, and hard red spring wheat. Uh, difference between winter wheat and spring wheat, uh, the spring wheat tend to be a little bit higher in protein than the winter wheat. We're still, we grew hard red winter wheat for the first time, and we didn't get enough protein in it to make uh, bread flour, which needs to be up at around at least, around 13. Our, our winter wheat was around 10. So Elizabeth and I are gonna do some experimenting with uh, cock dressing with nitrogen to try to get our protein levels up. Uh, so we grow oats uh, for feed and seed, the uh, rye mostly for the mill, uh, buckwheat also for the mill and I grow about a hundred acres of buckwheat on a contract for seed with agriculture. Uh, we grow red clover both for seed and soil building. Um, hammer, which Elizabeth talked about, it's one of the ancient grains. Uh, we grow small quantities of that, never more than maybe 20 acres, 25 acres. Uh, we have a dehulling facility at uh, our neighbor farm's place that we dehull it spelt. Uh, grass hay and straw. Um, so that's a basic outline of what we're growing. Um, and we process uh, all our grain on the farm. Uh, so a picture of uh, the seed cleaner I'm presently using. It's from 1910. It's a Sydney seed cleaner I got from a guy in Ohio. Uh, rolled it home on that trailer. It, I rebuilt it and now it, we've got it. Um, It'll do about three tons an hour of clean wheat feed. So uh, actually, the technology for these seed cleaners really has not changed much in 100 years. I mean, if you look at this machine and look at a modern machine, they're basically the same. And if you want to get into this, I got this machine for 250 bucks. You can find these old cleaners out there, scour the internet, scour papers. Um, they're really fun, cool machines to work with. I, I find them absolutely fascinating. Um, so, you know, this machine uh, new would probably be, you know, 25, 30 grand, you know, but you can find these old machines around. So, uh, look. So, we're cleaning and bagging grain. I um, mostly for my mill, but I also do a lot of seeds. Uh, so, we're cleaning, um, cleaning a lot of. There's another picture of the Sydney uh, cleaner. Um, I could go into an explanation, but I don't think we've got time for that. So these are the markets um, for the grain that I grow. One is farmer ground flour. That's the name of our small mill. Uh, the seed market, uh, I sell a lot of stuff for animal feed. Uh, another uh, market that I've got into is the selling to distillers. And you can get a really, really good price for your grain. Um, and it doesn't have to meet all the strict quality specs that the, when you're selling into the food grade market. Um, uh, the guy at Brooklyn Distillery, which is one of my largest uh, customers for my wheat, um, I actually, we did an experiment with, the, we had high vomitoxin wheat that was actually too high even for animal feed. And it turned out we did some consulting with different uh, people about whether the distilling process, the vomitoxin goes through the distilling process. Everybody said it wouldn't. So we tried it and we distilled it, sent it off to a lab and sure enough there was zero vomitoxin in it. So I think the distilling 
is a good, we're talking about, say you do decide to grow 100 acres a week and you have a problem with it. It's low protein, vomitoxin is too high, um, some other quality issue. The distilleries, and there's lots of these small scale distilleries popping up all over the place. I'm shipping to Pittsburgh Distillery, Finger Lakes Distillery, Brooklyn Distillery, and now uh, Tuttletown uh, Distilling over in uh, Gardner, New York. Um, these guys use a lot of grain and they can take a lower quality quality product. You still have to get it clean, but you know that can be, to get a relationship with these distilleries I think it's important because you have to have a place to, to take this grain because not all of it is going to make food great. You're going to have some that something goes awry one way or the other. Um, and then just another market for my farm, we sell uh, a lot of straw for bedding and, and mulch. Um, this is just, I just think this is an interesting series of pictures. Um, this is a, a field of, uh, of spring wheat. I don't want to get into a lot of production stuff, but growing a clean crop is really important. Um, as I said, you know, if you get a lot of uh, weeds and stuff in there, it makes the cleaning process more difficult. Uh, this is a, a field that anybody in many of these sessions talk about time weeding grain to serve weed control things. You guys know about time weeding. They didn't have time to get into it. I probably don't have time to get into it either, but this is a time weeder is, is the type of uh, weed control you would use with small grains, all right? So this is a picture of uh, a wheat field the day before I time weeded it. That was right after I time weeded it. And you can see, if you look at that, it looks like pretty well I killed the crop. Um, this is one week after, and then this is two weeks after. No, maybe that's three weeks after, but you can see how the crop comes back. Um, and this field, you can't really tell from that photo, but that was so weedy, it was, a, I mean, an absolute train wreck. So this was kind of chemotherapy. Typically, you may not, you may not destroy the crop like that, but a, a, a wheat crop can really take a terrible beating with a time meter, and it comes back with an absolute vengeance. So, um, yeah, we did it more than once. You do it once we plant the seed. Right as the seed germinates, keep track of it. It'll be about five days. It'll start to germinate as soon as the tail starts coming out. Run over the field pre-emergent with the time weeder. That'll take that first flush off. And then wait till it gets to the three or four leaf stage. That's what it, that's where it's at in that far picture. And then what we do is we run over it once, one direction, turn the time weeder around and come right back over it. And basically, you want to have it look like that, almost buried, so you think the thing's dead. Um, and I've told guys to do this over the phone because I, for the farm to bakery, um, I'm the sort of tech advisor guy, so farmers are calling me a lot and asking me questions. And I tell them to do this, and they call me back, and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I'm like, calm down, calm down. Because this was actually the first time I ever did it. And I came home and I said to my girlfriend, I said, I'm, I feel like I'm going to throw up. I said, I think I just killed my whole wheat crop. So I said, why don't you go out there and take some pictures of it and then we'll see what it does. And so sure enough, it, it, it comes out amazing, amazing. Um, there's some Glen uh, Hybrid Spring Leaf. You can see how pretty it is. Yeah. What do you think the benefit of going over again? What, what, yeah, just going over it once. Um, what I found with the time weeder is, and I have a Kovar time weeder. There's Einbach and some of these other European varieties which have a, a closer time spacing. Is when you just go over it once, there's a lot of weeds that you miss the first time. And by going over it twice and coming back the opposite direction, um, and even better if you do a kitty corner one direction and then kitty corner another direction, that way the times tend to get into rows. I mean, I could go into the minutia of this, but uh, I found going over it twice you got better coverage. And maybe if you had a better, I have sort of a about the most cheese ball time weeder that they make. Um, if you maybe had a better time weeder, you might be able to get. Uh, 
because the first, the way I got into doing that, the first time I went over that field, I went into the field and you look at it and I was like, man, there's tons of weeds left. I better do it again. Uh, and that's how we sort of got that technique. I mean, what's even better, you have a bunch of ground, separate the field into sections and do one section and then go do another section and then let that other section sit in the sun for a little while and then those weeds that are kind of partially uprooted or start to wilt well down. Or even if you can wait four or five hours and then go back over it again. Sometimes you don't have that luxury, you just go over the field the same way. But if you can let those weeds wilt a little bit and then hit them again, uh, it's pretty amazing. So this is um, Hard red spring wheat, Glen, and you can see this is the the ancient grain emmer over here. You can see a little bit of different color. I think that was from the first year I grew it. Uh, we grew it next to a stand of spring wheat. Uh, I was out checking for vonatoxin. And another thing uh, I would say is, you know, monitor the crop before you harvest it. Go into the field and look at it and see if you'll see. Um, the heads will be sort of white. They'll have these little, what they call tombstone kernels. They'll be underdeveloped kernels that are kind of white. Sometimes they'll have this uh, pinkish hue to them, which is, is that the actual fusarium? Yeah, you'll see these pink kernels in there. Um, and if you can identify fields before harvest that have this, separate those out. You know, what, what we did this year and what we're going to start doing is we're actually going in and pre-testing all of our fields before we combine them. And we went around this year and we, we tested, we didn't pre-test, we wanted to see, uh, to check each field to see how much differences there were in vomitoxin, protein levels, falling numbers and things like that. So we went around and took a test with every field we combined, sent it in and then collected all the data to see how much difference there was field to field and area to area because I'm spread out in about a 10 to 15 mile radius from my farm because I rent everything. So you can get different amounts of rain at different times. Uh, and as Elizabeth said, if you're getting a lot of rain when the wheat is flowering, you know, keep an eye on the crop. Now, vomitoxin is kind of, as far as I'm concerned in terms of diseases and problems, uh, that's one of your, one of your real concerns. Um, and you don't want to harvest a field that's got a lot of vomitox and mix it in the bin with a bunch of good wheat and then you've got a bunch of garbage. So uh, as much of a pain in the ass as that is, you kind of you kind of have to do it. Um, so let's see, so I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, farmer ground flour, which is our mill, and also the wide awake bakery, which following the French model, uh, um, we now have a bakery that's associated with our flour mill. And the, the, how we got into this is um, this guy, Stefan, who was running the Wide Awake Bakery, we were using him to trial our flowers when we were just getting going. And because um, the, the fresh stone ground local stuff does not bake like what any baker is used to. It's, it's very different in the way it, it acts and handles. Um, and through his baking trials on our flour and giving advice to us, we realized that this guy could make incredible bread and came up with the idea to have a bakery that was associated with the mill, uh, both as a product support thing, where he's the tech advisor for our mill to other bakeries, which we found is really important. So any new customers that we have, they just start working with our our flowers, they're having trouble with hydration or some other aspect of how the flower is behaving. They can call Stefan up. He works with this flower every single day. Uh, I think he's up to almost 900 members and it's, we have a bread CSA. So we're baking it into bread and um, people are picking it up at a bunch of different locations in our area. But, um, and we already talked a little bit about the flower mill. Um, this is a little uh, <laughs> diagram of how this whole ownership thing that we've worked out. There's another farm called Cayuga Pure Organics um, that is also an owner of the flour mill. So the, the our mill is owned by my farm, which is Oshner Farm, Cayuga Pure Organics, which is another farm. They farm 
uh, I think close to 600 acres as well. And um, Greg Mull uh, is our miller. Greg was a Cornell student who I got to know through a project with one of his classes. And when he was a really sharp guy, he was interested in local foods and grains. And when he got out of college, uh, I wrote them into signing on to be our miller. He knew nothing about milling. And the guy is absolutely amazing. He's making, I think he's been doing it for three years. He's making really fantastic flour now. But we went through, just like Ed was saying, we went through such a massive learning curve. Like we thought, hey, we'll take a bunch of grain, we'll throw it through this flour mill, and you have flour at the end. And we were so, so ignorant to the complexities of making really good flour. Um, we, as opposed to Ed, have sifting equipment. We make all sorts of different uh, types of bread flours. Um, and uh, CPO also does a lot of dry beans, as the, like Ed does. Uh, CPO, uh, from farmer ground flour, flour goes to Cuga Pure Organics. They have a whole crew of people. I think they have six people down in New York City, uh, warehouse space. We go to 14 green markets, I think, and ship to almost 100 different locations in New York City. Um, so there's this whole sort of marketing wing down in New York City that's run by CPO. They also do all our internet sales for the flour mill. Um, so Ashner Farms, you see there, I already talked about that. Um, you know, one of the things Glenda wanted me to touch on is do we buy from other local farms? And we definitely do. Um, we contract grow spring wheat with the local dairy farmer. And there's a couple of other guys we buy rye from and wheat from. And um, as I get to know people grow wheat for us, I see what kind of product they bring in. If it comes in nice quality, like Craig Phelps as an example. He's in a, also a better farming area than us. He's in the Genesee Valley, really good soil. This guy grows like absolutely wonderful spring wheat. Like I think the last stuff we got from was 14.5 protein. I mean, just gorgeous. And he's also in a different area of the state. You know how weather can be. One area is too wet, one area doesn't get sh uh, showers. So what we're doing is trying to put some, get farmers that we like, farmers that do a good job, and contract with them to try to spread out uh, the area that we're growing grain in. Um, and also, as Elizabeth touched on, you can only grow wheat so many years in a row. I mean, my rotation is a seven-year rotation, and there's wheat only in there once. So, you know, on 600 acres, how much wheat can I grow? Well, I can also grow rye and corn and some other things we can use for the mill, but you know, to, as our mill gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we're going to need to contract with more and more farmers. Um, then you see the Wide Awake Bakery uh, with the Bread CSA, and I'm a part owner of the bakery as, as well. Um, here's our, this is our stone mill. Um, that's just the stones are split. Uh, so how am I doing on time? Should I kill it? Five minutes, okay. So um, why did we start this flour miller and why should you consider starting a flour mill? For me it was, I wanted to do a value-added product. Uh, the area I'm in is starting to develop with a lot of housing. I rent all my land um, and I just thought, you know, in another 20 years, what's my land base going to look like? I might be down to 300 acres. So, you know, this was years ago I started thinking, okay, how am I going to make every field of grain produce more income. And so I started thinking this is a value-added value thing. I also, my grandfather was a German immigrant. He was a master baker. I grew up running around in a bake shop. I was always been interested in this. So for me, I think it's really interesting. Um, I like meeting all the people. I like being able to see my product uh, go to somewhere and made into uh, something that I can eat. I mean, that's, you know, for a vegetable farmer, that's maybe just part of the deal for a grain farmer. If you're growing feed, tractor trailer truck comes, you load it up, it goes to a dairy farmer, the cow eats it. He never tells you if he likes it or never says thank you. So, uh, the other thing that was a big push by the New York City green market, June Russell in particular, 
Um, they were looking for people to produce flour down there because they were trying to get... They still are, right, as Glenda said, you know, we're still trying to ramp this up. Um, she really encouraged us, got us into some of the better green markets where that can take, like for a vegetable grower, I think that could take, you know, years to get into uh, some of these really coveted markets. They got us right in there because we had a unique product, so that sort of sort of kicked us in the ass a little bit. We started in 2009, uh, as I said, stone ground. We also try to freshly mill it. We kind of mill it to order. We don't mill a whole bunch and have it sitting on pallets somewhere. Um, and we're trying to use uh, um, heritage varieties. We're working with Elizabeth on that. We've started growing this warthog wheat, which was a big hit. There was a, a tasting trial down at the French Culinary Institute that we all went to, and for whatever reason, maybe it was the baker, I don't know, the warthog was the big hit. So I started, so of course I planted a hundred acres of it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> How about this year? It's a hard year. Yeah, well this year was a tough year, so I planted, got all this expensive seed and planted it, and then because of all the rainfall, that's what we're kind of surmising. There was a lot of end leaching in the soil, and the, the wheat, I think, was a little starved for nitrogen, and the proteins too low. So I got all this beautiful warthog wheat. It grew really nice, but when we tested it, it had good falling numbers and um, about zero vomitoxin, but the protein was 10%. So I can't use it for bread flour. So what we're doing is we're grinding it and we're going to send quite a bit of it. I'm going to send some of it to the distilleries because they like low protein wheat. And then there's a big bakery called Bread Alone. Um, and they're going to mix it down at their bakery with high protein flour that they get from out of state. There's a rule that they green. Yeah, go ahead. Can you use some white flour? With that? You mean like an all purpose flour or? Well, I mean, I'm only going to use holy flour. Yeah. Yeah, we can make a white flour, yeah. But it's, you know, there's the thing called extraction rate, which is how much of that flour do you, how much is the weight? When you put that grain in and you grind it as whole wheat flour, you get pretty much 100% of the weight back out. Well, white flour, they say the extraction rate, a pretty good extraction rate, like if you get 60% of the weight back, that's really good. So you end up losing. So how do you turn the bread off? You sift it. Yeah, we sift it. We have we got this really kind of old <laughs> dinosaur of a thing. But in the, Adam Greg Mole calls me up saying, can I find customers for the, the brand? Yeah, so you end up with a lot of brands. We sell it to an organic dairy for animal feed, but you know, if you don't get the same price as you get for your flour. But you can buy little sisters, I think, and start playing around with it. You seem like you like to experiment, so that would be, that would be fun. Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Some of it's glutinous, some of it isn't. Isn't what really matters? The, well, this is what we're finding out, too. There's like gliadins and glute, glutenins. Is that right? Am I using the right? Yeah. And because in France, actually, they use some pretty low protein wheats to make bread, and there's a ratio of different types of glutens. Um, and, you know, even talking to these, the experts about this, you know, some of them say, try to make some bread out of it and see how it goes. So you're right, but uh, you know, when you talk to bigger bakeries, they want to know specs. And that's why Elizabeth was saying, get your grain tested, because if we buy it, you know, we know if the protein content is high enough or at a certain level, you know, it's going to be pretty decent. But he's got a good point there. It's more complicated than total protein. And this is, you know, we're still in the, it's still in the learning process. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, Elizabeth? Yeah, I just want to get the theory of what you're making. Um, we won't ever consistently get working like that. No. We don't have the right product. We don't need to. And another thing that we're starting to push in, just talking about money, is something with green markets, as a matter of fact, over in green markets, um, to start uh, doing some baking short courses because bakers need to get experience in working with these lower protein meats, which can, in many cases, make Fantastic yeah. Yeah, and it's totally different. You know, the baker has to really want to work with this stuff and figure it out. You know. Yeah. Go ahead. In the way that you're marketing, um, have you found that there's uh, also the same amount of interest in the pastry? 
Doug Flowers and those kinds of those, because in our area, white wheat. Yeah, yeah white wheat. The big, well, white wheat is the traditional wheat. Is New York State is a big white wheat state. Um, we don't sell as much white wheat as as hard red wheat. Um, and maybe that's just a marketing thing. If we could find a pastry place that wanted to have, uh, you know, white wheat flour. We do sell quite a bit of white wheat flour, but not, you know, probably three or four to one red wheat to white wheat. Yeah, I would like to grow more white wheat, but white wheat is also very ticklish to grow. It sprouts very easy. Uh, red wheat is a little bit better harvest window. Um, White wheat, this year I didn't have to dry it, but white wheat typically you, you combine it pretty much as wet as it'll go through your combine and not make mush, and we dry it in an artificial drying room and, and put it in just to, because if it gets dried down and you get some rain showers, it'll start sprouting and your falling numbers will be, be really low. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. So here's the, that's, I'll wrap up really quick. There's a picture of our mill building. Um, there's our, that's the grinder. Um, products, markets, I guess that's the end of it.